I am so grateful for the invitation to come here and talk with you all because this invitation has helped me make a decision that I'm going to tell you about. It's a decision I've been trying to make for a lot of years now, and it's been a hard decision. It has to do with the question of whether I want to continue serving as a litigator in my work as a lawyer. Now, you probably know what litigation is. It's courtroom battle. And for 31 years, I've been a litigator. And I've enjoyed it. And one of the reasons I've enjoyed it is because I see litigation as an opportunity to make the world a better place. I got that idea from growing up in a time when civil rights cases, civil liberties cases, pushed back the resistance of segregation, advanced the frontiers of civil rights and civil liberties and housing and voting rights in public accommodations and in the workplace. But when it came time for me to figure out what I was going to do for a living, the idea of being a lawyer was not quite right. I was a a hippie. I was a child of the 60s. I was accustomed to walking picket lines to desegregate retail stores, to marching in anti-Vietnam protests. I was more accustomed to wearing jean jackets and tie-dye t-shirts than the uniform I'm wearing now. Like, as a hippie, I couldn't imagine myself looking like this. So uh, I thought I'd be a teacher. So I went to graduate school in American Studies. The market in American studies was terrible in the 1970s. Maybe it still is, I don't know. But uh, I, I needed another way to make a living. And so I became a hippie woodworker instead of being a hippie graduate student. And I loved that. I did that for seven years. But pretty soon I began to yearn for a way to make my livelihood help make the world a better place. And so I went to law school. There's a picture from my law school graduation day. The only thing I wanted to do as a law school graduate was to be a litigator, to go into court and fight the good fight. And so I set up my first law office. There's my mascot. Um, actually, that's not my first law office. I, I didn't want to be that kind of lawyer. I wanted to be the kind of lawyer that took on high impact public interest cases. And so I joined a distinguished Boston law firm called Hill and Barlow, where my colleagues and I took on, in addition to commercial work, various kinds of public interest cases that we hoped would make the world a better place. That's me in the front row back in a time when I was thinner and taller. And uh, I had the opportunity to take all the way to the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court an important privacy case involving the right not to be randomly drug tested, not to have, some, have your boss come up to you in the middle of the day at a random time and say you had to provide a urine specimen. We established in that case that employees have a right of privacy. I had the opportunity to represent Thomas Lee Ward, an inmate on death row in Louisiana for quite a number of years, and it was my privilege to get to know uh, Thomas over those years. But most of my cases were really mundane. My first commercial case was representing the owner of this grocery warehouse. The roof started leaking in the ninth year of a 10-year warranty. Now, having a leaking roof in a grocery warehouse is like not cool, right? Not a good idea. Um, this was, at the time, the biggest roof in New England. It was a six-acre roof. And it was covered by a membrane manufactured by a company that my client, the building owner, wanted to sue to get money to replace the roof. And so even though my wife thought this case was really boring, I'd come home and tell her about all the pretrial discovery we were doing, depositions, and so forth. I thought it was really exciting because I discovered that this company had actually been hiding the evidence that they had roof failures all over the United States with this material. And so we won this case, but there was one problem. It took nine years to litigate this case. That's right, nine years. Now, that's not the average case, but many cases, most cases in our court system take more time and more money than we really want to devote to them and especially when there are family cases, litigation can sometimes create heartache, antagonism for the 
family members, and particularly if kids get caught in the crossfire, this is a terrible way to resolve conflict. And so I began wondering, is litigation really the way that I'm going to help make the world a better place? So I called up my law school advisor, Frank Sander at Harvard Law School. Wonderful man, took my call. He's one of the pioneers of the alternative dispute resolution mo movement. He said I should get training in mediation. And I did. And some of you may know what mediation is. A mediator helps resolve conflict by facilitating negotiation. And so there you are with parties on each side, and you're helping them solve problems and maybe even achieve a higher level of understanding. One of my first mediation cases involved a doctor and a nurse. Now these two worked in the clinic of a homeless shelter. And the nurse walked off the job in the middle of a shift protesting the lack of supplies and the lack of equipment. And she had been complaining about this for weeks. And finally, she reached the point of frustration where she said, I'm out of here. Now, I learned in the course of this mediation that in the medical world, leaving a shift, in the middle of your shift, is a cardinal offense. And so the clinic had no choice other than to fire her, which they did. And she was here at this mediation because she was about to sue the clinic for wrongful termination. She said, I'm a whistleblower, and firing me is just wrong as a matter of public policy. And when they walked into the room, my co-mediator and I could tell these are two people who actually had a very deep respect for each other. And so we asked them to look into each other's eyes and to speak from the heart about what it was that led them to be at the table with us that day. And the doctor said to the nurse, you know, Terminating your employment was the, probably the hardest decision I've ever had to make as a doctor. He said, you are such a dedicated nurse and such an experienced nurse, and I know how much you care about our patients. I am so sorry that I had to end your employment. And she looked at him and said, well, I'm sorry too. I'm sorry I left you in the lurch. I'm sorry I put you in a position where you had to fire me. She said, you could be making so much more money <laughs> doing other stuff as a doctor. I just have such deep respect for you. And so their eyes were starting to well up, and my co-mediator and I were getting a little teary. It was like very touching. And after having that exchange, they very quickly settled the case. Now here's the remarkable postscript. About a week later, the community mediation center, where we were volunteering that day, got a note from the nurse and thanking them for providing mediation and donating half of her settlement to the center so that they could provide more mediation for other people. Now, I got to tell you, as a mediator, it doesn't get much better than that. This is like the kind of magical moment that you wish for when you get your mediation training. But I don't want you to get the wrong idea and think that, <laughs> that mediation is always a kumbaya kind of experience because, you know, frankly, it isn't always. We'd like it to be. Uh, one of my cases involved a large family, and they came to meet with me over a weekend, Saturday, Sunday, 20 people, 15 in one room, five in another room, and they were going at it. They had been going at it for years. There was so much hostility. Many of these family members hadn't spoken to each other for years. And one of the family members who was particularly adversarial and belligerent took me aside and he said, Hoffman, he said, you've done something in this case that I didn't think could be done. He said, you've made a really bad situation even worse. <laughs> so you can imagine how I felt. I was getting a little defensive. Frankly, I wanted to punch this guy in the nose, which is not a cool thing for a mediator to do. <laughs> but I tried to remember my training in mediation, to get calm, get centered, and get curious. And so I said to him, I wonder what it is that from your standpoint, I could be doing more skillfully so I can help you and your family members resolve this conflict. And as soon as I got calm and curious, he started getting a little more calm and curious. And we talked, and he helped me. He gave me some ideas, and we settled the case. And at the end of those two days, these family members who had not spoken to each other gave each other hugs, 
We wrote up an agreement. And I still get notes from some of these people. So the lesson for me is one I learned from reading Pema Chodron, a Buddhist priest, who said, even the most difficult people can be our teacher. And the lesson from another Buddhist priest and activist, Thich Nhat Hanh, that to create peace, we must be peaceful ourselves. Now, 16 years ago, I added another tool to my alternative dispute resolution toolbox. In addition to mediation, I got trained in collaborative law. Some of you may know what this is. Collaborative law means representation without litigation. The lawyers are in the case only for negotiation. Parties can go to court if they want to, but they've got to hire other lawyers. And the collaborative law process, we exchange information freely. We negotiate in a cooperative, non-adversarial way. One of my collaborative law cases, quite memorable, involved a couple getting a divorce. And we had these very productive meetings. The two lawyers, the other lawyer and I, two parties, got along so well that at the end of the case, the wife said, does anyone have a camera? I thought, why, why do you want a camera? And she said, well, this negotiation was so constructive and so amicable. I feel so good about what we did here. I want to take a picture of us all together. Now, this isn't actually the picture of that case, but you get the idea. So now my docket consisted of litigation and also mediation and also collaborative law. And I began to wonder which one of these doesn't belong with the other two. And I started to ask myself the question, to litigate or not to litigate? That is the question. Now, one of the reasons why it's a hard decision, remember I said it's, litigation is expensive? Well, it's actually a pretty good way to make a living. So if I'm not going to litigate anymore, I'm turning away work. And frankly, I need a paycheck. So I've got to make sure if I'm going to stop litigating that I can replace that work with other work. Second, I love winning. I mean, doesn't everybody love winning? You know, there's a part of us that likes to cooperate and get along. But there's another part of us that likes to win. And the other thing was, let's go back to that fundamental principle of making the world a better place. How are we going to advance social justice if we don't go to court? And I thought about our medical system as an analogy to our legal system. In our medical system, if we had mostly surgeons and very few internists and general practitioners, well, one thing is we'd have a lot more surgery, but it would be an unbalanced system. We need surgeons for the most serious cases in the most difficult circumstances. And we need litigators for those cases where we need to defend people who are unjustly accused and to advance human rights. We need courts. We need litigators. But we also need peacemakers. And frankly, we need lots more peacemakers. And so I was reminded of the saying, a very important saying, from Mahatma Gandhi, that we should be the change that we want to see in the world. And so I've made today the day when I'm going to be a full-time peacemaker. I have the deepest respect for my colleagues who go to court and fight the good fight. And frankly, if it's one corporation against another and the gladiators need to go at it, great. But starting today, I'm just going to say no to litigation. Now, I'm not the first lawyer who's done this. One of my mentors and friends, Woody Mostyn, was a great trial lawyer. And now he's leading the movement for lawyers to become peacemakers. And he no longer goes to court. My friend and colleague, Kim Wright, same thing. Great trial lawyer. She doesn't go to court anymore. She even persuaded the American Bar Association to publish her book, Lawyers as Peacemakers. I have colleagues, Stu Webb, who came up with the idea of collaborative law. Pauline Tesler, who wrote the first case book, first course uh, textbook in collaborative law. And these people are all uh, litigators who decided they're no longer going to go to court. And I uh, see them as the people who've walked down this path ahead of me. And I'm so grateful to them. Peacemakers all. Now, I want to tell you one quick story. One of those peacemakers, Dan Finn, uh, said to me one day that he decided to stop going to court when he realized that he had to say to the judge that the party on the other side, the wife, was a worse person than she really was. 
and to say that his client, the husband, was a better person than he really was. And he said, I'm not doing that anymore. Now, being a peacemaker has a great lineage in our legal system. Abraham Lincoln said, discourage litigation, persuade neighbors to compromise. As a peacemaker, the lawyer has a superior opportunity becoming a good person. I very seldom quote Chief Justice Warren Burger, but he said something really important here when he said the entire legal profession has become so mesmerized with the courtroom contest, we tend to forget we ought to be healers of conflict. Did you know Mahatma Gandhi was a lawyer? And he said when he learned how as a lawyer he could settle cases, that his joy was boundless. He realized the true function of a lawyer is to unite parties, rent asunder. So now my work full time is to be mediator, collaborative lawyer. I teach wonderful students in mediation. They're my students from my course at Harvard Law School. And so my job now, folks, is full time peacemaker. Now, remember, no justice, no peace. And the challenge, the frontier that we peacemakers need to be focused on is how to make sure that in trying to achieve peace, we don't forget about social justice. I don't wear my politics on my sleeve, but I wear them on my lapel. I wear them on the back of my car. And I just want to say to you, you can become a mediator. You can get mediation training. You can become a volunteer mediator. And you can become a peacemaker, either full-time or part-time. And if you do, please get a support group, as I did. Uh, my colleagues, we call ourselves the five guys. And I've learned so much from Marvin, Daniel, Gregory, Homer, about social justice, about peacemaking. I'm going to leave you with one final thought. Peacemaking is a journey, not a destination. We can accomplish great things moving forward if we all row together, and not going to kick anybody out of the boat, right? And we can make the world a better place, one conflict at a time. Please join me on that journey. Will you? Thanks very much.